Good morning. I want to start by thanking the Fundacion and its partners for the opportunity to be here and to come to Brazil and see the work that Frameworks is doing. It's nice to catch up with my colleagues. Um, we've been talking for the past couple of days uh, about what science has to offer uh, to public policy. Um, so today I want to step back one step further and talk a bit about what social science has to offer science as it attempts to affect public policy. Um, so for those of you who are veterans of past symposia, you've heard my colleague Jack Shankoff. Yesterday you heard uh, Chuck Nelson, uh, members of the Scientific Council on the Developing Child uh, that we've worked with now for more than a decade. Um, behind their presentations, if you remember the things that they say, are, uh, is the social science that we bring to this discussion. So the, the partnership between social science and science, I think, is, is what contributes to the overall effectiveness in translating for public policy. Uh, so my, my talk today is organized first uh, conceptually around the idea of framing, uh, arguably one of the most important uh, ideas, concepts in social science in the last several decades. Thank you. And, and how we at Frameworks have operationalized the pursuit of, of framing. And then I'm going to map that onto uh, early child development and how we've looked at uh, the way that people think about early child development and what we have to do as communicators in getting the science uh, across. <clears throat> now let's see if I can do better at advancing this slide deck. Aha. Uh, so I want to begin by saying <clears throat> that our work is not confined to early child development. Uh, it is what we'll be talking about today, but the method that I'll be uh, explaining can be used to pursue uh, any number of issues. Uh, many of you are, are interested in education and in early skill development. Uh, we take this method and we apply it to education and skill development in our country. Uh, we work on issues of environmental health, how people understand the interplay between individual and population health and the environments that we live in. So, so this, this, the set of work that we do is much broader than what I'll explain today, and we publish everything on our website. So if there are issues that, that interest you, you can go on our website and find them. Um, we are also working internationally, and we're very pleased to, uh, to be here in Brazil. We are at work in Australia, in Canada, uh, and uh, about to begin a project in Great Britain. So it allows us a lot of interesting cross-cultural comparisons about how people in different countries think about fundamental questions of how children develop and what prevents them from uh, realizing their potential. <clears throat> Andrea talked about the mission of our work. It is a translation mission. It is to uh, bring scholarly research to bear upon the question of how we do a better job of enlisting our fellow citizens in understanding uh, core social problems that confront our societies. But in order to do this, what is unique about frameworks is that we brought together uh, an array of disciplines. Uh, so uh, with us today are our colleagues here in Brazil who are anthropologists, and we have a good representation of anthropologists on our staff, also of psychologists, sociologists, linguists, political scientists, uh, people like me who have been frontline advocates. Um, and it is because of the confluence of these disciplines that we are able to do the work that we do. So we are rigorously multidisciplinary, and we recognize the challenges of doing work across disciplines, of, of translating concepts that may sound the same but actually mean different things in different, different disciplines. So our work begins in, in this disconnect, where an expert is standing up and saying AAA, and the questions that come back from the audience all sound like BBB. So something is lost in translation. Something is standing between the expert and, and the people they wish to engage. And I want to show you an example of this in, in real life that comes out of the work that we do on the streets talking to ordinary people. Um, so we tend to think that we can avoid this lost in translation process if we just boil things down and make them very simple. So here's this very simple statement. From birth to age five, children develop foundational capabilities on which subsequent development builds. Very fundamental 
statement about early child development. Now listen to what happens when ordinary people try to interpret what that means, when they try to talk about it in their own terms. They need to understand how to develop kindness and compassion, and they need to understand how to read and write. What are the fundamental skills and abilities for those kids? Reading and writing. What's happened over the last few years is we've kind of gotten away from the basics, um, arithmetic and, and English. He needs to know his basics when, I mean, he in kindergarten, no, um, his little coloring and doing a little ABCs, his little numbers and stuff. So if you, if you look at what the expert was trying to say, they were trying to talk about the importance of social, emotional, and cognitive <clears throat> abilities as being intertwined. And the phrase, foundational capabilities, set off a different understanding in people's minds. And what they talked about were the basics. In, in the United States, what we call the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. And in the process, they aged the child up. The child was no longer birth to age five. The child was a school-aged child. And so from this way of talking, we evoked a different way of thinking that led people back to things that they know and believe. Let's look at another one. The scientist says, the growth of self-regulation is a cornerstone of early childhood development that cuts across all domains of behavior. And this is what you get. Responsibility, first of all. By someone, you know, always showing them, you know, what's right from wrong. Good line makes sense if you have proper value in your family. And the way that their parents teach them to behave. So the expert wanted to talk about executive function, right? That was the cue that they were trying to evoke in people. But, but when they said the growth of self-regulation, what they got were moral values, that the parents need to teach and instill moral values. Very different uh, ways of thinking about behavior and how early childhood uh, contributes to later behavior. So what we tend to do when we find ourselves in these situations as communicators is we do one of two things. The first thing we tend to do is to try to correct people's mistakes. So we put out, at least in the US, we turn out millions and millions of fact sheets. A good half of them are organized this way. There's a myth, and then there's a correcting fact. The problem with that, in this one this is about flu vaccines put out by the Centers for Disease Control, is that researchers are able to show that they are ineffective. Uh, that in fact, people misremember the myths as true. So when you think about it, that's logical, right? You're, you're, you're reminding me of what I already believe. You're coming behind it with this thing I've never really heard of and telling me that it is more important than what I already believe. And so doesn't it make sense that I would walk away and remember what I believed originally? And that's exactly what happens. And it got worse over time. Uh, it, age made no difference. And my personal favorite, that they attributed the false information to the CDC, to the source of the information. So the other thing we do, in addition to correcting their mistakes, is we try to argue people out of their positions. So we'll say things like, you know, it's not true that kids will catch up later on, that you can wait you know, to delay your interventions. One in six children uh, who were not reading proficiently in third grade do not graduate on time. This is also an ineffective strategy. Uh, what we know is that it often backfires. And researchers had been able to show that it actually hardens people into their original positions. And they have this lovely phrase. They say, like an underpowered antibiotic, Facts actually make misinformation even stronger. So as we argue people, they remember what they thought originally, they harden positions, and you're not being able to give them new information that would allow them to come to different choices. The important thing about this is that in a democracy, it has profound consequences that People need to be able to catch up. They need to be able to take in new information. They need to adjust themselves to what science is telling us about how humans work, about how environments uh, get, get built into our bodies. But if people are asked to make decisions based on this hardening of their original belief systems, they aren't able to update their thinking. They aren't able to come along with us to make the decisions that citizens need to make uh, in an informed society. So what do you do with these kinds of misdirections? 
Um, what we believe at Frameworks is you need to rethink what communications is and how it works and what it's good for. And so instead of thinking that your message is this lovely little piece of information that you have uh, embellished and that you're dropping it into the empty vessel of a mind, the mind is not empty, that in fact it's a swamp in there. It, it is a place where many things are growing that have been there from our early experiences, ways that we look at the world, ways that we think the world works, our experiences in school, what we think a parents should do, what we think should be the role of government in our society. And some of these ways of thinking can be like alligators waiting in there to eat your information. And so if you don't know what is in people's heads to begin with, you can't construct a coherent strategy for getting that little fish out there to swim in that swamp. And this is a quote from uh, a linguist, uh, Deborah Tannen, in the US, and she has a lovely way of saying it. She says that people are not blank slate receptacles who take in stimuli in an objective way, but we are veterans of perception. We have stored our experiences in certain ways in mind, and the world being a very systematic place uses those things in mind and saves us the trouble of figuring things out each time. So it's this process that we want to focus on. What have we stored away as veterans of perception as we look at early childhood uh, development? The consequences of ignoring the way that people come to issues are profound for policy, and that's why we're having this discussion in a policy sense, that people may have very strong values. This is a, uh, a quote from a study uh, done by a group of anthropologists in the United States looking at environmental action, and they found that Americans had very, very strong environmental values. They cared deeply about the environment. But there was very little environmental action, and in fact, uh, membership in environmental organizations has been on the decline in the United States for the last decade. And so why is this so? Why can they not bring their values forward to become uh, uh, concrete actions? And the, these scholars concluded that the cultural models, or these ways that people have stored in mind of how the world works, uh, that are available to understand global warming lead to ineffective personal actions and ineffective policies regardless of the level of commitment. It's a really important takeaway that you, if you are not evoking people's values, if you're not getting them to be muscular, if you're not exercising them in the right way, they will apply a policy solution to an issue that in fact does not remedy the policy. So you're having, again, this disjunctive conversation, and what we need to do is to connect to those values and bring them forward and give people better ways of understanding complex socio-political uh, phenomena and scientific phenomena, whether it's global warming or early child development uh, or health. <clears throat> so let's look at this process of activation. So this is the core of the way that we think at Frameworks, and I hope that this will become something that you find operational in your own work, regardless of what the issue is. So we are people who live in discourses. We are talking every day to our neighbors, to our book clubs, to people on the bus. Uh, we are having conversations about the way the world works and the way that we should operate in it. And we are connecting those conversations to our lived and internalized experience or what some scholars call our, our working theories of how the world works. So we're observing things, we're listening, and we're comparing it and bringing forward things we know about how the world works. And every day we activate this. This is the process of meaning making that we do as human animals. So every day the world offers us up information, what we would say framed information, a certain storyline, a certain way that information is presented. Uh, and that information might take the form, in this case, of stress is an important factor to consider in development. That was the gist of Chuck Nelson's presentation, that the kinds of stressors that are presenting them to, uh, themselves to children are getting embedded uh, in the child's development. But in this case, the frame is not activating 
the cultural model of the world that you want it to. It is activating another way, at least that Americans know, to think about stress. And my colleagues here told me that this is a very non-Brazilian way of thinking about stress. They said that only Americans would think that stress is good. In Brazil, we know it is not good. So you'll have to wear an American hat here for a second. So the information from your daily newspaper comes in. It stress, says stress is important. It connects to a way of thinking that is a dominant theme in American public life, that stress does a body good. The more stress you have, the more resilient you will become, the easier it will be to triumph over the next obstacle. And out of this comes a conclusion or an opinion or an attitude that is, kids need stress. Why should we limit it? The child that had those multiple caregivers will do better because they have had multiple opportunities to adjust to the stress and to overcome it. So this is highly problematic. This, this process of activation is problematic if you don't know what you're going to activate. If you don't know how the way you talk connects to the way people think, which connects to their uh, professed attitudes or support for public policies. So our work begins in this kind of descriptive research. We, we run uh, different issues through this machine. And then we try to figure out how we change it. So what could be a different frame that would activate a different way of thinking? So how, how could we get a reframe, a different way of presenting a problem that would activate something that may be more recessive, but is definitely part of the way people think. Early experiences have long-term effects. We know that people think that way in the United States. It's just not a dominant way of thinking. And then we can study what the conclusions would be, what, what policies they would endorse as a result of thinking this way. And out comes a judgment. Bad stuff that happens early on can derail development. And so now early is prioritized. You want to protect children from exposure to toxic stress. And over time, if we can um, activate these kinds of these ways of thinking, if we can get enough advocates, if we can get enough experts out there uh, talking and framing early child development in the right way, we get a change discourse. We we widen the the space in the discourse to have this kind of discussion about what derails development. So this is the activation process that is imperative if you want to change discourse. In order to do this, we have a very complicated methodology, and I'll try not to bore you with it, but it's important to the work we do. Um, we don't just do um, uh, sort of little small group discussions or uh, big survey instruments. We have a very iterated way of looking at the world, which pulls from these disciplines that I talked about earlier. Uh, so initially, um, and this is what uh, my colleagues will be talking about here, we, we do interviews with experts, long uh, form interviews, tell us what it is you want to be able to communicate. And we then ask questions of ordinary people, cultural models interviews, to see what are those stored ways, those beliefs that they have about how the world works that are in mind, and we compare the distance. And that becomes the focus of our research. How do we narrow that distance? How do we pull the, the ordinary people's way of thinking closer to what experts know from the work that they've done? Then we also look in media. How, how are depictions of early child development in media contributing to these uh, uh, somewhat problematic cultural models that people have in mind. And typically, we see a mirror. We see that people are learning about social issues from the media, bringing these back and making them own and their own and connecting to the ways that their mothers and grandmothers told them uh, little kids work. Um, excuse me. We then study the kinds of frames that you all are putting out into the world. What are your brochures look like? What do your talks look like? How are you framing? What are, what are the choices you are making in language and concept that are going out into the public? Because this is a key part of the discourse that people are, are learning. Oops. We get people together in small groups uh, using techniques from sociology. And we look at how 
how their expectations of being in a social situation inhibits certain kinds of, of certain ways of thinking and promotes others. So how do people learn to conform to the dominant discourse? How do they learn to become part of the broader culture by learning what, what are acceptable ways to think about early child development, for example? And then finally, we do experimental research, and I'll show you a large-scale experiment where we vary the different values that we are appealing to to see whether they help people get closer to real policy uh, remediation. Over here on the other side, I'm going to talk a little bit about metaphorical research. We, we deal in metaphors. We make up metaphors. We test them rigorously. You've heard a lot of them in uh, Chuck Nelson's speech yesterday and in Jack's uh, Shankoff's at the previous symposia, previous symposia. So if you've heard brain architecture, if you've heard toxic stress, these are the kinds of metaphors that we invent and test to make sure that they convey uh, fundamental concepts that people need. Uh, we do these in on-the-street interviews. Those were some of the little videos that you saw. Um, we then take them into quantitative testing. And finally, we teach them to people uh, in groups of two and have people teach them to other people and have them teach them to other people so that we are confident when we have to stand in, up in front of a group like yours and say, using brain architecture is a really powerful tool to engage people that you can leave here and you can go tell your neighbor, your colleague, uh, your legislator uh, about brain architecture and you know that they will remember it and they will be able to use it themselves with other people. So, so this is the power of mass communications used properly. And out of this comes a reframing strategy, which is what we hope to be able to deliver uh, to Brazil on early child development. So let's use this process now and uh, apply it to early child development. Um, to do so, I'm going to put this little recipe from uh, a couple of scholars in the US, the Heath brothers. They wrote a book called Made to Stick, uh, which is quite a wonderful uh, book about uh, sort of the science, social science of communications. And they have this nice little recipe. They say, if you want your idea to be sticky, if you want to be able to throw it at somebody and they pick it up and they can't get rid of it and, and they have to throw it to someone else and they can't get rid of it, you want your idea to stick out there, there are four things you need to do. First, you need to know what you want to say. Second, you need to know why it isn't happening naturally. What's getting in the way of your communication? Third, you have to break people's guessing machines. The, those little cultural models that were sitting in mind that are just waiting there to be activated, you're going to have to get rid of them. You're going to have to break down that process of chronic accessibility. And you're going to then have to put something else in its place. Once you've broken their machines, you have to give them a different way to think. So let's follow this recipe and apply it to early child development. When Framework sat down with a group of scientists, of which uh, Chuck Nelson is one at the National Scientific Council on the Developing Child, it took us a year to come up with the set of principles that the scientists agreed people needed to know, that these are the fundamental principles of early child development. So you had developmental psychologists, you had neuroscientists, you had economists at the time. All of them had to come to agreement that these were the fundamental principles. So you could say that this was quite a triumph to get a group that diverse and, and uh, understanding the complexity of early child development in the way that they do to come up with this refined agenda. The problem is that it's a list. It's not a story. So if I, the moment I click away from it, you will probably not be able to remember it. They are just, it's just a list of principles, what we would call unframed uh, communications, that makes it very difficult for you to go out and make it stick. So the problem, as you try to go out and talk to the public, is that they know that there are a bunch of things that affect child development. There's fate free will, parents, genes, environment. They have no idea how these things come together, what acts on what. So the process of development is what we call a black box. And literally, they have no idea how what comes out is either a successful child or an unsuccessful child. So this is a, a very crude sketch of how the public thinks of early child development. So what is missing when we look at what's the difference between how experts understand and lay people? Well, certainly what's in the black box is missing. 
how these things come together and interact with each other. What's more important than what? So uh, we heard Secretary Bajos talking about that public policy needs to make priorities. You cannot prioritize this list because you do not know what is fundamental. You don't know what is the most important thing uh, to put your investment in. But also missing is the notion of public consequences. So why does it matter to me whether your child is successful? Uh, certainly in the United States, this is a, a, a major a part, portion of the work that we do is to try to move issues that have been in the private domain into the public domain so that people can see that what happens to children matters to everyone in a society. So behind this is uh, the swamp of early child development. So this is what we spend a lot of time doing in our cultural models interviews. This is what we will develop in Brazil, is what is the swamp of early child development in Brazil. In the United States, these are the, the things that routinely and predictably people answer when you say, how do little kids work? How do they develop and, and what is the problem? So they would say, development just happens. If you get out of the way, they will develop themselves. It is automatic. Um, it's very complicated. Everything matters, so nothing matters. Go talk to scientists, or in the United States, we would say go talk to your grandmother. Um, children grow up in the family bubble. It, the only thing that matters is what's happening in the family. And so uh, the ability to see that behavior is contextualized by environmental factors is almost entirely uh, lacking. Um, safety. So. We spend a lot of time looking at the physical safety of children, and we have a cultural model that the community is the predator. The community is the threat to children. So you want to keep them in that family bubble, wrap them up with as much cellophane as you can, and hope that you can deliver them on the front door of school at the age of five, and then they will be able to take it from there. So they're, they're, these cultural models are very deficient in any notion uh, of early childhood. So what do we do with this once we understand it? We use three kinds of devices. We use values, so we remind people what's at stake. We use metaphors to bring complex issues uh, into people's everyday world. What do you know about the way things work in your world? How boats float on rivers, how toasters work? Things that we have an everyday working knowledge of. How can we use the power of metaphor to allow people to get closer to the way that experts view the world. And then finally, we turn those lists into stories because we know that people can't remember lists and we know that we store experience in our memory as story. If we can turn things into narrative, we can get people to remember them. So let's look quickly at how we work on values. Um, values are things like shared fate, uh, being pragmatic or, or uh, practical about uh, uh, problems, prevention. And we take these into large quantitative experiments. Uh, typically, we have about 4,000 people uh, who are participate in an online uh, process. Um, uh, we recruit them from a panel of 6 million people in the United States that agree to take these kinds of surveys. Um, we randomly assign them to a different frame, and I'll show you the kinds of frames. Here, in this experiment, we had seven conditions. So some people were exposed to the idea that children are our future. Uh, some people were exposed to the idea that we need to be responsible managers of our resources. This was the argument that was made in the sort of economic argument for early child development, the Heckman argument. It's better to put your money in early than later. Uh, and then two frames that came from the field uh, that we need to uh, talk about the vulnerable child and address the child's vulnerability. And secondly, that everyone wants a healthy society. So these were the two candidate values that were out in the field as the best way to get people to uh, value early child development. Then we asked them uh, a number of policies um, so how do you feel, uh, are, are you supportive of uh, uh, policies that would prioritize children who've been abused for mental health treatment over other people, et cetera? And finally, we look at the differences. So the question we're asking here is, 
if we reminded you of a value that you already have, what is the consequence for children's public policies? These are the kinds of policy questions that we're asking. Victims of child abuse should receive priority in the allocation of mental health funds, et cetera. So, so we're not asking, do you like the value? We're asking, once you have the value in mind, what do you do with it? What are the consequences for policy of thinking this way? Here's an example of the treatment prosperity. You've heard uh, both Jack Shankoff and Chuck Nelson use this value repeatedly. The future prosperity of any society depends on its ability to foster uh, the well-being of the next generation. When we invest in children, it will pay us back through a lifetime of productivity and responsible citizenship. So this is literally the kind of value that people are exposed to online, and then they're asked these series of policy questions. And so here is the result of this particular experiment. So if you look at it, you can see that one value, uh, uh, well, actually, two values, prosperity and ingenuity, are lifting support across the policy batteries for between 10 and close to 20%. So the values of prosperity and ingenuity um, we're in, in, in the United States, we think we're a very ingenious people. We should be able to solve issues that confront children uh, and use our ingenuity to come up with better program designs. Look at child abuse across the uh, different values. So if, you, if your issue were child abuse, virtually any of these values would do better for you than the ones you're currently using, which are vulnerable child and healthy society. Vulnerable child and healthy society as ways to remind people about these issues is like saying nothing. You might as well throw away your communications. They are not getting you there. Now that doesn't mean that, that we don't value a healthy society, but it is not potent enough to pull forward these policies in ways that people didn't already have in mind. So values are very, very powerful brain devices to help people come along on the ride towards valuing uh, science. The second, uh, yeah, well, sorry. Societies at stake. Our population is becoming older. We're very dependent on children that are born now and in the future really being productive workers, productive problem solvers, very creative individuals because they're going to be fewer young people and more older people to be taken care of. So really the prosperity of the country as a whole and we could say the world as a whole. So that's Judy Cameron. She's a primatologist at the University of Oregon. She's a member of the National Scientific Council. She has learned to begin her talks by, by evoking a value. She used to just introduce herself as a scientist and to begin to talk about her research. Now she steps back and she uses the power of the value to get people on board with her. So this is the utility of this kind of research. Um, the next thing that we do is we invent metaphors. Um, so I want to show you uh, a little explanatory uh, metaphor um, uh, called serve and return that we invented. But the first thing you need to know is that um, we use these metaphors, uh, we test them rigorously. So don't just roll out of bed tomorrow and say, oh, I need a metaphor. Um, what you want to do is look at the metaphors that we've tested. Um, so I want to show you the way that we got to serve and return. Uh, talking with scientists, we talked about the value of play and interaction. And here we have an example. Yes, tell us more. So that's one of our colleagues' little boy, Zach. And so from this, from this interaction, we were able to come up with a metaphor that is that it's like the serve and the return of a tennis game or a ping pong game. And that the game, the quality of the game depends upon that mutual interaction. 
And, and when we were able to explain, serve, and return to people, they were able to see why it would be better to have the same caregiver, to have caregiver turnover. They were, able, they were able to understand why maternal depression would be problematic for brain development. So they began to see this reciprocal relationship as a cornerstone of early child development. And we know from the research that we do that people can remember and repeat and explain to others, serve and return. So I'm going to go past this. Oh, dear. So we can see that these early experiences are tremendously important in setting up the base. Oh, thank you. So that was Megan Gunner, <laughs> essentially using brain architecture. So I just wanted to use those, those videos to show you that people can, scientists can learn these and incorporate them into their scientific repertoire. So what we have done in changing the rough draft of the scientific principles into story is to fill in that block black box, now we have brain architecture, we have serve and return, we have toxic stress as, as principles that people can understand using the power of metaphor. And we have used the value to help people see that the, the success of individual children or their lack of success is a contributing factor to a prosperous or dysfunctional society. So we've filled in the black box and we've defined the outcomes as public. Um, Finally, what we've done is we've narratized. We have turned this into a story. So we have added, oh dear, we have a few little problems here in our headers. Why are other people's children my responsibility? Because the prosperity of the society depends on it. What actually develops? Brain architecture or air traffic control, our, our uh, metaphor for uh, executive function. What disrupts development? Toxic stress. So you can see you begin to have a story. What can be done? We can find the effectiveness factors in different programs, and we can figure out how to bring them to scale. So now wherever you start in this story, you can double back and tell the whole story. You have a narrative that you can remember and that people can remember. And importantly, as we add to it, and as we think of other things we want to talk about, we can develop sub-chapters in this story. So we've worked a lot over the last couple of years on child mental health. Brain architecture works beautifully to help people understand the importance of early child mental health. And there are other parts of this story that can be pulled uh, forward. And we know this because we go back on the streets, we teach the metaphor to people, and we watch the difference in the way they talk about early child development. So I want to show you just a series of people talking about early child development and child mental health using brain architecture. So these are people we've stopped on the streets, we've explained orally to them brain architecture, and now we ask them to tell us how they think child uh, mental health uh, relates to brain architecture. And think about how different these responses are than those earlier videos you saw where people were pulling from the, their models in mind. They need a solid foundation, meaning they need a safe environment, um, positive experiences with, you know, support around them. Your mental health is something that can be shaped, can be improved or, or uh, negatively affected. I think we need to get experts in the field more involved. Uh, well, there's people uh, in the, um, you know, like doctors, psychologists, um, and uh, work more with these kids and also try to get their folks more involved and, um, and pull as many resources as we can to try to assist them. Well, I'd first probably tell them, after having talked to you and thought about it a bit, about child mental health being an umbrella category that takes in positive and ne negative, good and bad. You know the, the overall picture of health, as well as you know subcategories too, the mental illness. So it's also a, you know, it, it's it's not just a, a mental or chemical issue. It's a, it's a health issue in terms of diet, the family environment, the school environment, the community environment. It's you know it's again it's a community problem. So in community can be your family, your neighborhood. It should be all of those things. Your church if you've got one, the local government, state, national government. So it's it demands a. A community effort in a variety of ways. 
So do you see the difference, how expansive they became, how the environment got into the way that they think about children, the community, the, these, so if you think of that swamp that I showed you where, where family bubble is the only thing that matters, now all of a sudden the community is uh, on the side of good child development and there are lots of other factors that are important. So these people are able to listen to a science communications. They have been primed to hear things in a different way. So what we do with this information to wrap up is we help the scientists that we work with change the way they publish their working papers. They didn't used to look like this. Now it's building the brain's air traffic control system, how early experiences shape the development of executive function. And as a consequence of making this more accessible to people, um, we actually have legislation before the Senate right now that uh, recognizes toxic stress, uh, that links uh, early deprivation and poverty with exposure to toxic stress and long-term consequences. So now, even at the highest legislative levels, people are thinking more expansively. They're connecting things in that black box to consequences for society. And finally, what we do is we help practitioners, whether they are clinicians or social workers or uh, health bureaucrats, to use a common language. Um, so in our work in Alberta, uh, these are a couple of people who have learned the core story of development and are now able to talk across all of the contributing areas about uh, how early child development works. Toxic stress has become a run-of-the-mill concept. Brain architecture, serve and return. These are things that now when we sit down around a table and discuss interdepartmental initiatives to help improve outcomes for youth in the long term are standard fare. And we don't have to explain it. When somebody says brain architecture, people say, oh, I know what that means, and they can just contribute to the discussion. So I think we have a common language that has made it much, much easier to move the agenda forward to help impact longer term outcomes for the better for our youth. We were already working on projects that needed the brain development um, aspect fleshed out quite a lot. But what I didn't have and what the symposium provided was a package that brought all of those pieces together in a very, very useful way. And then to top it all off, Frameworks helped me to talk about it. How to articulate my message to, to funders, to students, to, to audiences that are very, very diverse. So that is the destination of our work for you all who are here, is that if we can continue the work that we are doing in Brazil, we would hope to bring back to you both this common language and a way of thinking about uh, how Brazilians think about early child development and the kinds of metaphors that come from everyday experience here in Brazil that can be used to get them over some of the places that they're stuck. Um, and in the meantime, before we have results, um, I just want to end on things that I think can uh, be quite operational to you now, and that is that if good policy depends on good information, it requires us to distinguish between the social analysis of a problem and the communications analysis. And we need both. We need to know both why children are not developing in the way they should, and we need to know where people are stuck in understanding that process. And these are different things. If we confuse the one for the other, uh, we begin to have problems. Second, there is a science of cognition, how people think and process information that can inform the framing of issues. And so social science has a role at this table. Um, it's not just an art form, it is a science. And that it requires an empirical approach. We would say it requires multi-methods and a multidisciplinary approach, but at least it, inquire, it requires an empirical approach to the questions that dog us as communicators and that can help us refine our toolkit and break people's guessing machines. Thank you. Thank you.